Trevor, over the last several years, you've worked um, the number of schools, and your reputation um, is really to do with school transformation. Could you just tell me a bit about what you've been doing recently? Yeah, um, well, <clears throat> for the last two years, I've been running an organisation known as Lilac Sky Schools. I'm the Director of Education, and we've been working with a number of schools in partnership and in contract with those schools and we've been working really largely on trying to help schools that have either been in the national challenge or in uh, special measures or in some kind of difficulty move from where they are now to being somewhere much better. Okay, mm -hmm. if I ask you to say what the most important things are that you think that you've learned in, in recent years, what would they be? And there's a thousand things, aren't there? But two or three of the most significant things that I've realised of late. One is that probably in order to have a truly transformational impact on really challenged schools in very difficult circumstances, it's better to do that by bringing in a team of people. Um, the idea of the lone kind of hero head coming in and transforming a school and going away and leaving it transformed in a sustainable kind of position, uh, I think is is a kind of the, the myth of the comic books, really. Um, you know, if you're in your mid-30s and you're energetic and the world seems to be ahead of you, then it's possible to make some pretty significant changes, but you really need a team of people around you. So to bring in two or three senior leaders with a, a really successful head is the kind of start point. Um, I think one of the other things I've, I've fe felt or, or of realising the last few years is that there are kind of horses for courses. So I think it's probably right that to make the change in a very dysfunctional organisation, to make the change in a difficult school, needs one kind of leadership. And that might take two, three, maybe four, five years, uh, something of that order. Uh, and then probably to sustain that leadership, uh, sustain that improvement over a number of years, it probably then needs a different kind of leader. And I think growing the right kind of leadership styles and, and su suiting them, matching them for the right kind of school setting is much more important than we give, uh, give attention to. So does that mean something like um, if a school's in a tough time, you want someone who knows how to write a timetable, people who can get the children, uh, get a behaviour plan written so that everybody's pointing in the right direction. Um, is that the kind of is is that are those the tasks of the management team when you're when you're first turning a school round? You know, obviously leadership is one of them, and we started to talk about that. But organisational capacity in the school is really important. I mean, from simple things like getting the contracts right, you know, making sure the grass is cut, making sure vandalism gets sorted out, and that there's a process for dealing with staff absence and pupil absence. All those kind of organisational things, which are a bit boring in truth, but actually they lay the, the basis for then making the difference. The obvious things about getting behaviour right, having consistent and rewarding schemes, really exciting and relentless um, monitoring and, and curriculum for teaching and learning are obviously important. A couple of other things though which I think are, are really significant, I think communication is not emphasised enough in most models of school development, school transformation. Uh, and by that I mean, you know, both the public relations outside of the school, but also part of the job of the leadership, part of the job of a head teacher is to tell the story of the school. Um, it's to kind of narrate the journey that the school's taking. If you're going to tell a story, keep telling the same story and keep telling it to everybody. So schools get themselves in trouble by the head teacher standing up and, and berating the Year 11 assembly for their terrible behaviour, telling the staff what a bunch of idiots they are, but then going to parents' evening and saying, what a fantastic school we've got. Um, and really, you've got to tell everybody that it's a fantastic school, that it's, it's a successful school, because they all talk to each other out in the community. And I think it's really important to tell the very good things and the very best things about what the school is doing, because there, are, there always are good and best things. But if you don't narrate that story, you leave it to be told by, you know, the fight on the gate, the theft in the in the corridor, or, or, or you know, the worst thing that happens in the school that week, that day, or that month, and that story will stay and linger. So you've got to work really hard to counteract the negativity uh, of the things that go wrong in every school. And where do the students fit into that? Um, 
Well, I think that um, this. I think that one of the strongest things, and I think any good head knows this, that they can do is to kind of narrate that story with the students through assemblies, but not just through assemblies. You know, through the through the head and the leadership teams daily meetings with with youngsters, making sure that you interview large swathes of youngsters at key times of the year, year 11, going on into the sixth form, year nine options, um, that, that, the, that the students are involved in, you know, whatever you want to call them, committees, student voice, activities around the school, because if they understand the story, and they often understand it far better than the adults do, and they focus on the story because they've got a more simplistic way of looking at it at their sort of youthful stage in life, I think they're a really key part in telling the story because they go home and tell their mums, they go home and uh, you know tell people in the street, and that's really important. Suppose I'm... I'm on the management team, or I might be the head, in a school that's, let, 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 let's describe it as a coasting school. Um, what are the danger signs I need to be looking out for? If I want to be a good school leader, or a good member of a management team, what, what should I be looking out for? Quite often, you know, people who contact Lilac Sky Schools, the, the reason that they have done, uh, and it's probably the same for you, John, it, it, it's because they think they've got a problem with behaviour. Then when you go in and have a look at it, you realise when you look at it just sort of level two, uh, there's underachievement in terms of what the youngsters are achieving in their examinations and, uh, and their expectations of, of what they can achieve is too low. And there isn't a relentless kind of monitoring of what's going on in the classroom taking place. Uh, and there isn't great teaching and learning um, going on. I think th frequently the outcomes of complacency and the danger signs that people need to look for are in that, you know, school becoming slightly um, turbulent and un unhappiness, even in a what was other otherwise a, a calm and sort of decent school, children beginning to misbehave where it didn't used to happen, teachers being stressed and finding it hard to cope, and nearly always under, underneath that, uh, there's not enough accountability that's making sure that teachers are planning and delivering great lessons because as soon as they start to plan and deliver great lessons, then those behaviours start to improve because children are engaged, the teachers are less stressed, and the thing becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But pretty, pretty much the danger signs usually surface in you know, just low-level poor behaviours, which are then kind of, if you like, exaggerated in the minds of teachers who just feel these children just don't ever behave and don't ever listen. I know that recently you've been involved in the management of a, a special school. How different is that? Of course there are you know, outward signs of great difference. This particular school, um, the Priory School that's from September called Sky College, ha have been in special measures. It's an 11 to 16 uh, EBD school, okay, yeah. a school for boys with significant behavioural difficulties. They've been largely um, excluded from one or two schools previously and they come from all over Somerset. Um, and, you know, when you look at it on the face of it, I remember day one arriving there, there was a lot of boys roaming corridors, roaming around the school, smashing and breaking things, acting out very badly, which, which you know, from time to time that they still do. Um, but when you get underneath it, it's exactly the same things, because in the end they're ch children, they're people, and the teachers are teachers. There's nothing particularly special about special teachers. Um, it's simply, again, the symptoms of what's gone wrong with the school are in the behaviour. And what's gone wrong with the school is a lack of organisation, and then a relentless focus on teaching and learning, monitoring teaching and learning, getting teachers to plan, holding them accountable, reviewing what's going on, and delivering a really interesting, and I suppose even more so, an exciting and differentiated curriculum, um, which really meets the different needs of youngsters, because in any school, if you, if you deliver one curriculum for a whole range of abilities, you're probably going to be in trouble. If you just stand at the front of the class and talk, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. But in a school where the youngsters are very damaged, they've had difficult upbringings in many cases, and their ability to concentrate and learn is very limited in many cases, then you really have to provide really active learning that takes you outside onto farms, into motor vehicle workshops, into swimming pools, into all kinds of areas, which get them you know, living through their entire kind of body, not just through their uh, sight and sound. 
You use the word relentless a lot. Mm. Why? Because I think the single major failure of all the schools that I've ever worked in, and I'm sure it's true across the land, is that school managers and teachers introduce ideas which sound like great ideas on a Monday morning. Um, they tell all the kids and the other staff about them on Tuesday. They have a walk around the place on a Wednesday to see if it's happening. On a Thursday, they just review the idea. On a Friday, they drop it and never return. And so all the adults and all the children in the school begin to realise that when something new and a big, clever idea is, is hit upon, it'll be dropped pretty quickly as soon as it's been introduced. And if you're not relentless and don't pursue things through, then very quickly people stop believing that you mean it. And very quickly, they don't expect it to happen. Whereas if you are relentless, and when you say something's going to happen, you pursue it until it does, uh, then it, in, it, it encourages the likelihood that it will. So it's a really important part of our philosophy is, is being relentless. You move into schools with a team. And so um, uh, uh, the school staff and the school management team will find themselves working alongside you. I think this, is, this may be particularly important for senior leaders. How do you do it? The strength of a great leader is to be able to make those tough decisions based on a vision of what needs to happen tomorrow, not in fear of the hindsight of what might have happened in the past. And I think that's the thing which people can learn by working alongside people, by being coached by great leaders, by by working through training and performance with great leaders, but you can't do it overnight. It has to be something you do through a period of time. So resolution, vision, determination, a really good way of teaching it is through modeling. Yeah, I'd agree. <laughs>